The MacBook Air is Apple's top selling laptop, or actually their highest selling computer, period. And for good reason, it's super compact, extremely thin and lightweight, it doesn't hurt that it's the most affordable machine. And now we've got the M2 Air, which has been completely redesigned. It's a little more expensive than the M1. And I've been working on it full time for a while now doing my photo and video production work. But based on what you might've seen in some of the other reviews, you wouldn't expect it could handle it. It's also fine for occasional light photo and video editing, especially if you're using Apple's Photos or iMovie apps for those tasks. So today I'm gonna to put this M2 MacBook Air through some real world tests to see how it performs with professional photo, video, and audio software. So I always do photo and video testing, but I wanted to also see how the MacBook Pro handles music production. So I brought over DJ Disoriental. He's a music producer by day and a DJ by night. So let's take a spin through Ableton. Yeah. Okay, so reference, I uh, use a late 2013 MacBook Pro. Yeah, let's appreciate how much, uh, how far <laughs> we've come along. So yours is the Pro from yeah. back in the day, but you've said that it can be like pretty slow running Ableton, yeah. which is kind of the standard, like, well, it's one of the standard apps that a lot of musicians use is yeah. Ableton. So let's see how it handles it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so here's a bass song I just created. It's currently using five synth engines, uh, one engine for the bass and then just like a drum rack. This is it bare bones playing without any really like taxing components on the computer. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> okay, but so we wouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised that it yeah, works yeah. for the basics. Yeah. So let's see, what does it take to slow the computer down? So this is Ableton running with the smallest buffer size, which is gonna tax the computer, and all the synthesizers running at max voicing. Okay. And then we can just gauge the um, CPU usage on the top right here. If you look, you are getting a significant amount of CPU usage. Right. But the thing is, we're not experiencing any sort of audible glitches or cracks. So the MacBook Air is definitely able to handle a ton. So this idea of that it's okay for a little bit of light photo and video editing, I think is an understatement. That's kind of the old framework of how we used to think about these ultra compact machines. Now with the M2 and even the M1, you're able to push these pretty far and actually do real work on it, but there are limitations. By the way, this model has 16 gigs of RAM and the 10 core GPU with one terabyte internally. So it's spec'd up a little higher than I think most people would or even have to with MacBook Air, but we'll get to buying recommendations towards the end. Basically 80 to 90% of what I spend my time doing worked perfectly fine. So we were shooting this tethered photo shoot in the mountains, going directly into Capture One and it just ran completely smooth. There was never a moment that we were waiting for the computer. So all the tethering worked fine, adjusting images is totally fine, launching Lightroom or Photoshop is pretty quick. So when it comes to photography, you're safe with a lot more than a bit of light editing. But the one thing that slowed down is that I needed to export this whole batch out of Capture One, and that was thousands of photos, and it took all day. I just left it running for like six hours. Sustained loads, are a downside of the MacBook Air. Because there's no internal fan in here, it definitely does run slower if it needs to go for a while. But even as a professional, most of my workflows don't require that. So let's also crack open a video project here. I just forgot there's no USB-C port on this side. It's great that we have these two ports here, but why can't we split them between both sides? I know it's not gonna happen, but it'd be nice. And sorry this video is a little rambly and disorganized. I just wanted to get it out while these ideas were fresh. So this video in Final Cut Pro is a full-on commercial that we shot. It was for a client It's in 4K shot on the C70, mixed in with drone footage from the Inspire One. Like this is a proper commercial project. These are big files coming from professional cameras. And as you can see, they are just playing back perfectly smooth. Nothing is pre-rendered. You can see I've got background rendering turned off. And if you look at the timeline, nothing is rendered here. Plus each clip has color grading as the first layer. It has one of my custom conversion LUTs, which you can download in the description below. That plays back smooth. And then on top of it, I've got another adjustment layer with my film emulation LUT and another layer of color correction. So all of this is happening in real time with no slowdowns. There's also this little montage where a bunch of 4K iPhone clips are playing back. So we got four stacked videos at a time, completely smooth. I've seen one or two frames drop, but very, very few. So this means that you can work effectively on a video project with no hiccups. Resolve also was working well, but the slowdown will come on export. This project is relatively small. It's only 55 seconds. So if I just send it to the desktop, 
It took a minute and 15 seconds to export, whereas on the MacBook Pro with the M1 Max processor, it took about 35 seconds. So it's a pretty big difference. But again, it's about these different parts of the workflow, like the final export, you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer on, but during the edit, which is actually where you spend most of your time, you get this incredible performance. There is a catch that you gotta be aware of. So if you're planning to use the MacBook Air along with a large monitor, this is the Apple Studio display, 27 inches. It does work great for general use, but if we start editing video, you'll notice that on playback of this drone footage, and as it switches clips, it's dropping quite a few frames here. So it can depend on what your footage is. I find this drone footage is actually worse. I edited some full 4K videos using the setup and it, it, it did get through it without being this bad. But be warned, there is a price to pay when you're using an external display. Another example here, I want to try something that would push it a little bit further. So this drone shot, okay, it's pretty cool, but let's add some extra effects here. These are from Motion VFX. Using their new M Tracker 3D area, you can see that we are now generating a tracked square in the middle of the screen. So in real time, this is mapping out the movement of the drone and adding this 3D element to it. And then we can also add a uh, 2D title tracked in 3D space. Again, playing back perfectly smooth with no pre-rendering. Motion VFX plugins are already optimized for M1 and M2 chips, but so is most of the software out there right now. Premiere Pro and Resolve, they're all optimized, so they're all gonna do great. And also keep in mind what's happening here. I've also got QuickTime recording my screen right now. Uh, Photoshop is still running. So the point I wanted to make is that I think a lot of people only think about this as being a like knowledge worker computer where you're making spreadsheets or browsing the web all day, but it can really handle a lot more. Now, those are all the positives about this. Let's talk about uh, some of the limitations of the MacBook Air. When would you still want a MacBook Pro? Now, let's take a look at these things side by side. The size difference really is incredible and the weight difference, um, <laughs> but that's never actually bothered me. I always want my laptop to be the biggest and most powerful thing out there. So I, I'm willing to carry around something extra heavy and I even use this 15 inch on airplanes and doesn't bother me, it's worth it for me. But I know that that's not everybody out there. Let's just also take a look at this size comparison. Okay, right, so the reason that I'd still go to a MacBook Pro, which does still make more sense for some people, first of all is the ports. On just one side of the MacBook Pro, we have all of the ports that are available on the MacBook Air. And if we flip it around, there's still more ports to go. We got HDMI, another USB-C, and an SD card reader, my absolute favorite and the hardest thing for me to part with when I was using MacBook Air. If you find yourself tempted to make a lot of upgrades to the MacBook Air for it to meet your needs, that's probably a sign that you might wanna be looking at the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro processor. M1 Pro is still much faster than the M2 in so many ways. Plus it has active cooling. So for any of those sustained loads, it's gonna be much faster than the Air. So I think probably the easiest to recommend build for the MacBook Air M2 would be 512 storage and eight gigabytes of memory and you're probably gonna be totally fine. But if you start really specking this thing up and you've got 16 or 24 gigs of RAM, unless you have a specific need to keep a powerful machine as small as possible, the 14 inch might be what you're actually looking for. Now on the other end of things, if you're more concerned about price over performance, you're gonna be looking at the M1 MacBook Air, which, well, I don't have around here. But based on the other M1s that I've used, you're gonna be able to do a lot with it. That is such a capable machine. It's not gonna hold you back in that many ways. I would still prefer this at least for the MagSafe, the improved speakers, better webcam, better microphones. There's just so many details in this refined upgrade that I really appreciate, but it is an extra $200 US. So that's up to you whether it's worth it. One other thing I've been thinking about a lot since I've been on the MacBook Air is how much it's kind of filling the gap that I always wanted the iPad to fill. So iPads are, are awesome, like they're beautiful screens, but the software isn't as capable as I'd like. Mac OS is my absolute favorite. So still having access to full Final Cut Pro in a computer that's actually like lighter than the iPad Pro with the keyboard and mouse, it's also quite a bit thinner. So if you kind of need that second ultralight machine that an iPad used to fill the space of, the MacBook Air is making a little bit more sense for that. I'm gonna keep using this updated Air as my full-time machine a bit longer and see what is the limit? What can't I do with this? And I'd love to know in the comments below, what do you do with your computer that you don't think the MacBook Air could handle? I'll see you guys in the next video.